So I want to talk about anti-learning now, when it's so bad it's good again. <laughs> Something so bad it's good, I like it. Yeah, so you'll have to, you'll have to indulge me for a few minutes to, to get around to this, but you'll like it in the end. So it's something we've come across when we were doing uh, a data mining problem to do with uh, colon cancer. In a machine learning video, I already mentioned briefly about we're working with clinicians and we want to solve this problem where patients are roughly in four groups. One group, they're quite healthy, they haven't really got serious cancer. One group, the cancer is very serious. And then there's this big group in the middle where we're trying to say, how serious is it? And then the, the question becomes, should I get radiotherapy, should I get chemotherapy? And if you overdo the therapy, you cause more problems than good. And, and it's really quite important to split them, but it's very difficult to split the middle group. So we were given this data set of about 500 patients and for quite some time we were working on this data set and we were working hard and you know, you know maybe we make mistakes sometimes, we were quite good researchers and, and it, it seemed a good data set, 500, data, 500 people is quite a good quali quality of data. But we couldn't learn the difference between the categories in the middle. It really was difficult for us to do that. And we tried all sorts of methods. We started with supervised methods because they're better usually and they didn't really work very well. And then we went to some unsupervised methods and well, that didn't really make any sense in the data either. And we could do the, uh, the, the easy, the hard groups we could do, but we couldn't do the middle group. And we tried for about two years. I'm not joking. We're really you know, we're just tearing hair out. Is the data just rubbish or what, what's going on? We couldn't understand it. And then, it's one of those things that happens in universities, one summer I somehow agreed to supervise this uh, medical student on a master's project, I don't know why I agreed to this, and he came across sometimes to our office to have a chat, and, and he, was just, he was just doodling some pictures. And he was also peripherally working on the same data, not exactly, but he was doing something related to this data, and he was drawing these pictures. And I'll just draw you a few of these pictures just to, just to illustrate my point here. So a lot of the data comes kind of in ordinal values like one, two, three, four. The raw data obviously looks very messy, but then the medics have done something to it and they just said one, two, three, four, like levels. So he was drawing some of this data, let's say this could be a particular value of an immune component in your body. And like one of them, you might be drawing like this. And we're like, yeah, yeah, well, okay, that's, that's, that's what I expect. You know, it's one, two, three, four. And the higher number means you've got more of X, whatever X is, immune globulin X. Fine, okay, makes sense, understand. Okay, and then uh, he was doodling some more pictures and he was doodling pictures like this. And it's basically one, two, three, four. Okay, slightly less obvious, but I mean, I still understand, okay, okay. So he was kind of saying, yeah, but what this means is you have uh, four means, you have less of X. Okay, I don't know why they do it this way around, but medics aren't always that logical, you know, fine. Higher numbers, less of it. I, I can kind of buy that. Should start at zero, shouldn't it? Yeah, that's, uh, but let's not go there, you know. <laughs> I probably don't get that. Okay, but then, and this is where it got really, really interesting. He was doodling some more pictures. He was doing one like this. And I was like, what, what, what's this? One, two, three, four, and it like goes up and down. And he was like, yeah, because when you have a lot of this X or a little of this X, then you're really quite ill. And it's when you have the middle amount of X, then you're, then you're healthy. This is a good level of X. Great. So, so good, good X versus not so good X. And high and low is not so good. And then obviously the last one he was drawing was, it looked a bit like this, where suddenly it was like, well, you know, when you have a medium amount of it, that's when there's something wrong with you. You either have not a lot of it or you have a lot of it and then you're healthy. Ah, oh, this, this medicine is complicated, isn't it? So we're suddenly starting to realise we've got this, this data, 500 patients, and for each patient we had about two, 300 of these observations. And it wasn't sorted like I imagined, where one is small and four is large, but, well, sometimes one was small, sometimes four was large, sometimes one was large and four was small. I can cope with that. But then sometimes it was also like, the middle ones were good, or the middle ones were bad, or it was just like all over the place, completely messy. That shouldn't be a problem for the computer, you would think. We can obviously learn all these things. But the complication then came, there is 200 of them and they all work together. So what he was basically saying was, well, when this one is low and this one is high, that's good. Or when this one is medium and this one is low, that's bad. So, so different numbers and different combinations meant different things. And when he was talking about this, I suddenly clicked something. Now. Let's switch topics for a moment, something you might have heard in another video about the exclusive OR problem, XOR. So what's the XOR problem? Go on, I'm testing you now. Okay, if, uh, if the inputs differ, then you, uh, you get a 1, and if they're the same, then you get a 0. That's right, exactly. So we have two inputs, keep it really simple, two binary inputs, 0, 0 1, 0, 1. And basically, if they're the same, that's not good, we don't want that. But if they're different, yeah, you get your reward. 
And this is a classic computer science problem, of course, can be programmed in many ways. And it turns out this is also a classic computer science problem that's really difficult for computers to learn. And I, I'll just give you a simple, simple illustration why that is. So we just draw that again, but we just draw just slightly differently. So we have our two variables, 0, 1, 0, 1. So we were saying, if they're the same value, then they're not good. So this would be 1, 1, and this would be 0, 0. And this would be the two good values. So it would kind of look like this. Now, basically, and I'm simplifying a little bit now, but basically all this machine learning is actually learning a function that can separate the data into two groups. Or more than two groups, but let's say two groups for now. And a function, at the end of the day, again, keeping it simple, means you can draw a line through this that separates the two groups. Now, go on then. Draw me a line through this that separates the ticks from the x's. <laughs> Let's have a look. Okay, I think the lines... It's going to be a wavy line, isn't it? It's, you can't draw a straight line that separates those. There is no straight line you can draw, is there? You would have to be like this or something. Yeah, but it's not a line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. It's not a line anymore, is it? It's now a curve of some sort. Yeah, absolutely. This is it. So there is obviously a way we can separate it with something complicated, but there's no simple way of separating them anymore. And that's exactly what a computer finds when it's trying to learn this. And that's just for one zero one thing. Now imagine, and this goes back to our patients now, you've got 200 of them, and they'll go between 1 and 4, not just 0 and 1. And some combinations are good, some combinations are bad, and sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down. You have a 200-dimensional mess like this, basically. And it's just impossible to learn a function anymore that kind of separates the things. Now, once we realized this, we had a sort of brilliant idea of like, okay, so it's really easy to get this problem wrong, because obviously I can, I can, I can learn a line and it gives me the wrong answer. That's easy. So, how about this then? I just learned the wrong answer, and I know now it's wrong because it's the XOR problem. And then after I've learned the wrong answer, which is easy to learn, I then just reverse it. And we called it anti-learning. So we tried this in our big data set, and uh, it worked surprisingly well. I mean, before we were getting basically answers which were 45% correct, and you only have two, cho two choices, so it was basically worse than random. And now we're getting answers which are 70, 80% correct. So it definitely helped. So, so bad, it was good. And all because of the XOR problem. So what have I done? I've done a sorting of the data, and the approach I've done is something based on similarity measures. These unsupervised methods, they always use a similarity measure. In this case, I've done kind of by colour. That's I need to exclude. And I'm excluding what I know about um, how to drive and eating and drinking, what I have for lunch, and all my memories about the last, you know, 34 years of my life. Everything.